Um, on behalf of Paul Motor Center for Capitalism Studies and Platform Economy Research Group, I'd like to welcome you all to a talk by Paul Dorish. Um, Paul is a Chancellor's Professor of Informatics at UC Irvine since year 2000. And in addition to this, he also has courtesy appointments in computer science and anthropology, a fantastic combination that we don't see very often. Um, he's from Glasgow, not the one in Kentucky, the less important one in Scotland. Um, but he went to school in Edinburgh, studied computer science. It's a place where science studies originated, many of the revolutionary ideas of actor network theory and place of science in, in society. He is seen as by far the most eccentric professor at Irvine, according to one reviewer, um, anonymous <laughs> reviewer. Um, he worked in Apple, in Xerox, a visiting uh, position at Intel. He has over 150 scientific papers, all indexed, 19 patents, uh, 34,000 citations to his work with an age index of 74, which means that he has at least 74 articles cited by at least 74 people, which is like, you're talking about one of the most important scientists, I believe, of our times. Um, his research focuses on understanding information technology as a site of social and cultural production. His work combines topics in human computer interaction, social informatics, and science and technology studies. He is the author of several books, where the action, action is the foundations of embodied interaction from MIT. Second book, Divining a Digital Future, Mess and Mythology in Ubiquitous Computing. And my favorite, personal favorite, that really changed the way I looked at platforms. Um, a, I bought two real copies of it accidentally. I was so excited. Um, the stuff about bits, an essay on the materialities of information. I had the book, I'm going to distribute just, you know, circulate, you can just take it, look at it. It explores the material arrangements of various digital objects, that is how the information is represented and interpreted. Um, one of the most important things that this book accomplished is that it was one of the rare examples of where we saw how digital things, we're considered to be a digital age, is actually growing on and made up of by materiality in new forms of materialities, new form, forms of institutions. So he was one of the reality checks who uh, said, wait a minute, this is not like from atoms to bytes. We are living in a, a world that is being transformed, but we need to be very careful about these new forms of materialities. Thank you very much for joining us. Anytime anybody uses that most eccentric line, I have to always point out, my colleague Jeff Brooker noted that the competition for most eccentric professor in my department is really quite strong. So, um, so, so I'm, please, please look that um, It's been delightful to be here uh, today. So thank you very much for the invitation and the opportunity uh, to, to, to come and talk with you. We had a really great uh, uh, workshop with the, the Platform Economies Group uh, earlier in the day, which um, I'm, I'm, I'm going to spend some time thinking about. Uh, um, what I want to talk to you about today is AI. Actually, I realize that's not true. I don't want to talk to you about AI. I'm going to talk to you about AI. I'm going to talk to you about AI because as far as I can tell, um, it has become the law um, that I, it's very difficult for me these days to go to a meeting where we are not talking about AI. I'm not sure I really want to from the bottom of my heart, but that's what we're going to do. What I'm going to give you, this is um, very rough and very early, so I hope you will uh, um, you know, think with me and help me figure this stuff out. Um, this is the first, actually I was going to say, this is the first you know, attempt to, uh, to talk about this work in public. It's actually worse than that. I haven't really started thinking about this until Karai asked me for an abstract the other week. And it's like, oh, okay, fine. But I'm going to try and do something that takes some of the, the stuff I'm thinking about with respect to AI just now and interleave it with the materialities conversation to see where that, um, to see where that, that leaves us. Um, so I'm actually going to come back to materialities and what I mean by materialities of the digital um, in, uh, in, in a moment. But I'm going to start off 
um, with this word, with locality. So when I was a wee computer scientist, um, conversations about locality were, uh, were, were a big part of my life. Not so much when I was learning to program, um, but more when I was a, an undergraduate student and we started to think more about systems at a larger scale than programs, the notion of locality manifested itself in all sorts of places. So the notion of locality as a feature of software systems is roughly this, that if a computer program accesses data in a particular memory location, it is generally likely to come back and access that data again soon or to access data that is stored nearby to the piece of memory that it has just accessed. If you will forgive me for not defining what I mean by soon or nearby, although the nearby we're going to maybe come back to. It's a sort of this, this fundamental notion then that the way that computation proceeds frequently exhibits this sort of property of locality, that things are handled locally, that accessing one thing is going to cause you to access other, other similar, closely located kinds of things. It applies at lots of different scales. Um, uh, so for instance, if I <clears throat> want to read a file to, like, you know, to look at it on the screen, I read a PDF document to load it into my, <coughs> into my PDF viewer. You know, I'm going to read the first part, and then I bite, bite, and I'm going to read the second bite, and I'm going to read the third bite. They're all closely located together. Everything I read is just after what I just read. I, by and large, don't jump around in the file and grab things from all sorts of places. It tends to, like, my, my, my PDF reader is going to read this in a sort of straightforward beginning to end kind of way. If you think about how a computer program operates at the level of the instructions that are in your computer, by and large, it's going to execute one instruction and then it's going to go on to the next one. Sometimes it'll jump around, sometimes it'll branch. But the natural and default order of things, the first primary thing that the computer is going to do by, by itself is execute one instruction um, after, after another. At a different level, and perhaps one of the reasons these things or this idea sort of arose, if you think about the kinds of things that computers did back in the 1950s when they were first being developed on a commercial uh, basis, they were typically used for sort of records processing type applications where I have, I don't know, a whole bunch of accounts to go through that I have to update. You tend to read one record and then the next and then the next and then the next and so forth. So at these different scales of data access, of instruction execution, of database records, and so forth, this broad property um, can be observed, this property of locality. Now, the question arises then, why anybody would talk about this? Um, it might be an interesting feature, perhaps, but it's the, the fact that it would be sort of central to early computer science education is, is, is you know, a little bit mysterious, except, of course, that one wants to then see if there are ways in which you can take advantage of this uh, feature. Lots of the ways our computers operate do take advantage of this feature, such as, for instance, when we access memory, we tend to access it blocks at a time, more than just one byte at a time, so that I'm going to be able to grab not only the data I want, but also the data that's nearby, so that when soon it will be probably read, I've already got it there. Um, so there are reasons to be interested in it. Um, it arises as a, um, as a property of the ways in which programs operate, is observed as a way, a property of the ways in which programs operate, but then starts to become something that we both optimize for and indeed design in. Once I know it's there, I'm going to try to build my software systems to take advantage of this thing that I know. But once I'm like committed to building software systems in that way, I'm probably going to start building systems that, given the choice, will exhibit this property all by themselves. Um, so, so it goes from being an observed property of software systems to then being a desired property of software systems to then being an achieved property of software systems. And indeed, 
it's sort of this operation at multiple scales produces a complex interlocking of many different kinds of elements. So, so this, this, this is a PDP-7 computer. It was introduced in, I think, 1964. Um, not one that made a major impact upon the world in many ways, although it has the, 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 the uh, interesting historical feature that it's the computer on which the Unix operating system that's then the foundation of Linux and all sorts of other things including the operating system on my phone. Uh, it, it was the, the foundation, it was the computer on which um, that was first implemented. Um, and the guy who did that work, Ken Thompson, um, noticed or found when using this computer that it had this property, it had a couple of um, memory cells, registers, that had this property that when you access them, they would automatically increment, right? If, if the number one was stored there, you would read it, and it would automatically change itself to two. And then when you'd read that, it would automatically change itself to three. So it was constantly updating itself. Seems like a bad idea to have memory that changes by itself, but that particular way of changing is actually incredibly useful. It's incredibly useful if you want to do something like read consecutive pieces of memory. You know, I've got a base address, and I want to read address number one, address number two, address number three, address number 5,000, um, all the way up. So it's really useful to have this thing that's for doing that counting for itself because it produces this locality that I want. So he noticed there was this hardware in here, in this computer, to do just that. And he ended up um, encoding that as this notion uh, in, a, in a programming language he was developing called B, where you could similarly have a variable that would increment itself. So if you say I++, plus plus, it gives you the value of I, but it automatically bumps I, so that the next time you look at I, it's going to be plus one. There's about three people in the world who've ever used the programming language B. Um, <laughs> but there's many who used its successor, which was called C, um, there used to be debates about what the successor to C would be, <laughs> whether it would be D. In fact, explaining this, the successor to C was called C++. Um, uh, so and this same feature is part of C++, which is also part of the name. It's part of the Java programming language. It's part of um, many, many, many contemporary programming languages. That in itself is perhaps not necessarily terribly interesting, but what I want to try and show you here is this idea of locality of scan that, 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 that might cause us to want to scan memory is something that's not just then a property of programs that we might find, but it becomes, as I said, a sort of a desirable property. It becomes also encoded into the hardware on which we build our programs, which are automatically conceiving of themselves as executing programs that depend upon or want to exploit locality. It becomes encoded into the programming languages with which we describe to computers what it is that we want to do. It's, encoded, it's at all these different kinds of scales at once. The scale of the instruction set and its hardware, the scale of the programming language, the scale of the software systems, the scale of the storage systems, the, the disks and, the, and, and so forth, um, and memories that I use to, um, to, to, to store things. So, you know, I described it here as an observed property, as a desired property, and then eventually as an achieved property, as is this something that I would explicitly go and set out to do. But in fact, it may well be that due to, because of these sort of interlocking scales, we should think about it as an inescapable property that certain kinds of systems have. Um, it, you know, the only ways I have of writing computer programs in C or C++ or B maybe even, um, as a historical exercise might do, um, is are, are ways that sort of are predicated on this notion of locality that things are going to be close by to other things that if they're, if they're, if they're temporally um, uh, uh, linked, then they will be spatially linked. This is the sort of thing that I have in mind when I talk about the materialities of software systems. 
I'm not so much interested, actually that's true, I am very interested, but I'm not going to talk about the what I sometimes call the brute materialities of, 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 of the digital, right? The, the fact that, you know, servers are actually in particular places and they consume real power and they require real air conditioning and they would really break your toe if, they, if you drop them, them on it, uh, you know, that, that it's, it's like it's stuff. Yes, of course, it is stuff, that's important. What I think is, all, is, is even more important, or at least equally, is the fact that the, that, that the stuff of the digital, the stuff of software, similarly has its materialities. It materialities for software lie in the way in which programming languages and as expressive media resist our will or smooth paths that make it easier for us when imagining problems and imagining solutions to build particular kinds of um, solutions to address particular kinds of problems. They, they pull us in particular kinds of directions or make it more difficult for us to implement alternatives. The materialities of, um, of locality or of these programming languages um, steer us towards building systems that both exhibit and indeed depend upon, for a certain extent, upon locality, such that to be able to build things without locality might begin to be challenging or problematic. So, and it happens due to the interlocking of these multiple different levels. If it were just in a programming language, it probably wouldn't matter terribly much. But if it's in the programming language and it's in the processor, then that begins to be a complex that it's harder to pull away from. And if it's in the language and the processor and the storage system, my, my sort of movement towards a particular kind of configuration of the way in which the system works begins to be sort of like predetermined and pulled in a particular kind of, a particular kind of way. That's what I mean when I talk about the materialities of, of, of software systems. So let's go back and think about locality for, I, just, for, just for a little more. Locality is a property of certain kinds of software systems, but what kind of property is it? We have all sorts of theories of computation. We have theories that say what sorts of um, numbers we can calculate, what sort of formulae we can calculate, what sort of programs will work and what sort of programs will not. You know, they're normally called computability theory, right? Complexity theory is about the relative strengths of different kinds of algorithms and different kinds of solutions so that I can tell what's going to be a fast sorting algorithm or a slow sorting algorithm in different kinds of places or whether how I'm trading off time and memory and so forth. We've got, we have different kinds of theories. Locality features nowhere in any of these. Complexity theory has nothing to say about it. Um, Although I would argue that locality is somehow is, is arguably more important, perhaps, than complexity. They teach you about, about, about locality in the first year of your computer science program. They don't start getting computability compu 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 theory until the third year. So, um, so anybody who drops out before year three, is, they're taking locality away with them. Um, but locality just doesn't feature as part of these kinds of, these kinds of theories because locality doesn't enable us in itself to do something computationally. Locality is perhaps instead about what I'll call feasibility. Programs that don't exhibit locality still work. They're just kind of clunky and slow often. In order to be able to optimize for programs that exploit these features, we can still build programs that don't. It's just that they're going to sort of trip us up in various unexpected ways. They're going to slow us down. They're going to like have a hard time operating. But in interestingly, they have a hard time operating in a way that by and large escapes the theoretical reach of the major kinds of mathematical tools by which we, um, by which we do things. But it's about feasibility instead. It makes something happen faster, more easily, so that I can then ask the question, is, like, is it worth doing this? Is it worth calculating this answer? Is it worth engaging in this analysis? Um, is it feasible that I'll get an answer within the time limits that I, that I want? It's, a, it's, it's not a feature, it's not an ontological feature, right? It's not a feature of what, the, what can be done here, but it's a feature of, um, it's about feasibility.
Is it feasible for me to do this? Now, feasibility is relative, right? It depends on me. If, if the question is, do I want to do this thing even though it's going to take a week of computer time, maybe that's worth it to me. Maybe it's not. It's relative to me. It's not a feature of the program. Okay. Let's talk about AI. Um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time about what AI is. It's not clear to me that AI is anything. What I do want to say quickly, though, is just like what kind of sort of broad thing am I talking about when I talk about AI, which is also mostly what these days we talk about when we talk about AI. You can say there have been sort of two major waves, um, two major styles of AI. Some of you may be very familiar with this, sort of what um, uh, John Hogland used to call GoFi, good old-fashioned artificial intelligence, which is this sort of symbolic mode and a more contemporary statistical mode. A symbolic mode might be captured by something like this. The point of the symbolic mode of AI is that the internal things that make up the representational structures that the computer systems are using are meant to capture something that we understand about the structure of the problem domain. If I want a system to reason about what a bicycle is and what it can do and how I'm going to use it and how I can take it apart and what I might, I might be able to substitute for it and so forth, I need to understand that by breaking it down into these other kinds of components. But those other kind of components are things that you and I can somehow recognize as being related to the bicycle, its wheels, its seat, its frame, the bicycle shop, and so forth. So you know, symbolic AI, by and large, builds these sort of symbolic descriptions of the kinds of things that accord with our understanding of the structural domain. And symbolic AI proceeded happily through the late 1950s and then you know, on into the, 19, into the 1980s. Um, but in a contemporary mode, has been supplanted by, uh, by a statistical approach instead based on um, what are known as neural networks. So the insight in the neural networks was um, instead of trying to capture a cognitive account of what must be going on in our heads as we reason through problems, suppose we jump a level down. We know... We know um, that, uh, that, you know, that what's going on with computation, with, with, with cognition is happening in grey goo in our heads. Suppose we started to model the grey goo. We modeled um, um, relationship or like link, linkage networks between different kind, between neurons, between elements that might simulate something about what's going on in the, in the grey. Um, I will say, by the way, just um, most AI researchers these days could care less about what happens in the brain. They're interested in the accomplishments of these new kinds of technologies. But the original motivation was one to capture something about how it was that neurons work. And so we'd end up with something like this, where each one of these links is essentially like a neuron that's connecting um, uh, uh, one node of this network to another and there's patterns of excitation as they shoot little messages at each other, they shoot little activations um, and then they all sort of like, you can imagine this a whole but like, you know, I don't know, pinballs bouncing around with all these things sort of like lighting up. And, and the, 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 the notion that the neural networks people had is like, can I get this to do the kinds of things that we used to think of as being intelligent? So the way that they normally do this, there's, there's a series of inputs. Let's see what we're going to say. We're going to say that this is our network for determining the difference between pictures of cats and pictures of dogs. So I'm going to send the pixels of my picture um, to, on, the, on the inputs here. Um, and then I'm going to, in what's called supervised learning, I'm going to tell it. See this one? Picture? That's a cat. This one, this is also a cat. This one, that's a dog. And I train it enough, that is, I show it different pictures, and I allow it to try to like, figure out what the right weighting is of the different kinds of components in order to produce the answers that I, in the first instance, am telling it. I'm getting a training data to say, this is a photo of a dog, this is a photo of a cat, but I let it figure out why it's a photo of a dog or a photo of a cat. And after a while, if I've been successful, I can put new pictures of cats and dogs in here, and it will successfully identify for me which one is a cat and which one is a dog. What happens when I show it pictures of wolves or wolverines or tigers? Who knows? 
And also, and importantly, I said that in the symbolic mode, I care about bicycles, but the internal elements of this are elements that have something that I can recognize and you can recognize that have to do with bicycles. What's happening in here? Nobody has any account of. This is, all we know is that statistically, this is, you know, we have, we have numbers associated with all of these things. It produces the effect that we want. There are ways in which I can um, analyze the statistical properties of this network, but um, nonetheless, the actual details of what's going on inside, I can't tell. And in particular, it seems incredibly unlikely that any of these are about, I don't know, whiskers or pointiness of ears or um, fangs or, or anything else. So, so that's, the, that's the sort of the very basic intuition about what's behind neural networks. The other term that you will hear a lot and read a lot is uh, deep learning. And deep learning is essentially just what happens with this when instead of two layers here, I have 20 or 40 or 100 or 100 or 150. The depth of the network um, is, is essentially how many layers of indirection are there between the inputs and the outputs across which some kind of collective processing is happening that will produce me an answer that I want. In putting these slides together today, because um, I only put these slides together today, um, I noticed something else as well, or I noticed something that I have, it's always been there, I just never really, did, never really noticed before. Symbolic AI is largely vertical, and statistical AI is largely horizontal. What that, is, what that means, I don't know, but they're always built this way rather than the other way. Whatever. <laughs> My point is, when you hear about deep learning, it's just this, but with more of these. This is where the deep is. It's in the middle of this network. And what finally connects some of these ideas together is that there is and has been no major radical algorithmic breakthrough that enables deep learning. There have been lots of little things along the way. There's lots of work that's, involved, that's been involved in managing to successfully operate with you know, networks with 100 or 150 hidden layers. But essentially, the, the deep learning revolution is a revolution, of, a revolution of feasibility. It's not that new things became computationally possible. It's that new things became computationally feasible. They became feasible in a couple of different ways. They became feasible because we started to have data about things in a radically different kind of way because of the data trails that we all generate by moving around in the world with our cell phones because of the way in which we do activities online, thus making them essential, making things like everyday purchasing patterns essentially a datafied experience, because of the introduction of, it, of information technology into um, all sorts of spaces and all sorts of walks of life. Um, right, there's just more data around such that new kinds of things can be, um, can be analyzed using something like a neural network, deep or shallow. They also became uh, uh, feasible because computers became faster um, and you know, larger and could do more things. And the, what used to previously, you know, you could always have built a deep neural network. It's just that it would have, come, it would have taken it a year and a half to figure out whether something is a dog or a cat. And nobody's like, we can figure that out faster than that. Um, it's not really useful to anybody. But now that we can do it at scale and we can do it faster and I can analyze millions of pictures at once, suddenly a whole different set of things become feasible. But there's no other, otherwise there's no particular computational breakthrough. Um, and we started to build hardware that's optimized for doing these things and so forth. So there's multiple different kinds of elements that have gone into this thing about feasibility. But one of the things I would like you to walk away with is this idea that actually deep learning is simply about feasibility. It's about what has made it not computationally possible, but just computationally reasonable for us to do deep learning. And it turns out locality is part of this. If we have um, large collections of data, um, It turns out that the property of locality in the way in which I described it earlier, that is, 
um, largely proceeding from one thing to the next or keeping all my data accesses local for a bounded period of time is not really a feature of how these um, statistical algorithms operate. They do that other thing where they grab data from all over the, from all over the place. Um, so instead, I find myself needing to manage locality in a different kind of way. Um, and the locality that we tend to end up with um, in order to be able to make these deep learning algorithms work um, is a spatial or geographical locality, right? Going back to what locality sort of means, which is if I want to do large scale inference over extended data sets, I kind of need them to be in the same place. Because my accesses are not necessarily uniform, um, it's not going to work terribly well if my data set is on my computer and your data set's on yours, or half my data set's in New York and the other half is in Los Angeles. It just, um, you know, the network, the network latency, the network transit, all these things don't work very well. Certainly we build computer clusters out of multiple computers, but we don't connect them together with TCP IP. We don't connect them together with the kinds of commodity protocols that you and I tend to, tend to make a lot of use of. So part of the feasibility of deep learning is also grounded in a issue of locality, but here it's a geographical locality. It turns out that when we ask questions like, what would happen if we put these data sets together, we really mean together. We don't mean what happens if you take your data set about um, you know, block by block cancer incidents in Manhattan and I take my data set about uh, you know, blah, whatever, I don't know, bacterial infections and water supplies, whatever, and we want to like see if there's a correlation. We actually do need to co-locate and I mean physically co-locate those. When we decide that we're going to use Amazon Web Services as a scalable platform for doing it, and we upload our data at Amazon Web Services, we are not only sending it all to Amazon, we're also sending it all to the same place. And it's critically important that it be the same place in order for this stuff to work. The reason I think it's interesting to talk about this um, is because, uh, you know, we, we think about the problems of the ways in which we interact with a variety of organizations or institutions around data. We think about the problems of, uh, of data privacy and data access. We think about what Google knows about us individually or collectively or Amazon or Apple or whoever else. And we worry about that particularly, I think, with respect to, for instance, the consolidation of firms. So, so here's one for me, for instance. I bought a Nest thermostat before Nest was bought by Google. I was kind of pissed off when Nest was bought by Google. Like, Google now has a sensor in my house that tells me, well, actually, in my old house, I haven't put one in my new house, um, that, tells, that tells them, like, when I'm there. I would not normally do that. Um, but that now happens because of a, a, a corporate relation. In that particular case, it was sort of acquisition, but it doesn't even have to be acquisition. There's various other kinds of conglomerations by which my data um, moves outside of my, outside of my control. Um, such that even with the best world in the world, and even with a very carefully sort of managed uh, you know, threat, what's the phrase they use, threat profile? No, threat surface, whatever. Um, uh, you know, it's, still, it's still going to be um, subject to all sorts of um, uncertainties. And we see that around the consolidation and the development or the, the rise of these sort of like giant corporations based on data processing such as Amazon, Google, Apple, Facebook, and so forth. What I want to suggest is that the technologies and the materialities of AI over-determine that consolidation to an extent. It's not just that there's a corporate interest on Google's part to acquire all these other firms um, that sort of like gradually you know, uh, grow, its, um, grow its data sets, grow its capacities. It's that it's also demanded by the technologies of contemporary deep learning. Deep learning doesn't work outside of the kinds of um, radical co-location that is a consequence of, um, of, of this sort of corporate consolidation. So this is not simply a story about um, the economics of, of the digital world and the economics of digital corporations. It's also a story that's entwined with the, uh, the material configurations of the particular kinds of technologies that, upon which we have um, you know, uh, 
uh, premised our current, notion, our current notions of AI. With all sorts of consequences then, for what we think the opportunities might be to put a break on an effect. If we wanted to intervene into um, the problems of data, uh, um, uh, data harvesting, if we wanted to intervene into the, the problems of big tech and advocate for, for breaking it up, as some have done, um, you, we, we, we run into the fact that this is not merely uh, a, a, a capitalism argument. This is not merely an economic argument. It's also a technological argument. So let me think about a couple of different elements of that. Um, so, so, so one of them is the idea of, sort of, of, of AI as a service, which is an idea upon which many, many corporations are um, banking, uh, which is the idea that I could develop AI technologies, deep learning technologies, and then um, offer, the abil offer to other companies, the, uh, or indeed individuals perhaps, um, um, an AI service that they could incorporate into their own products or into their own uh, platforms or platforms or, or offerings. So in the same way that uh, you know, web services have made storage a service or, or compute a service, I should be able to make AI also into a service um, such that we're amortizing the, 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 the cost of the research and development that I have to do to produce new, kind, new kinds of AI. But that works only if the data of those who want to make use of this AI service lives in the same place as the AI service does. So immediately, the, 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 um, the consequence of that way of working um, is one that requires that the data be made available to a third party, um, processable as a third party. Now, this is something we all like, live with all the time. Um, Tell you my usual story about this. Actually, if I got a letter one day from UCLA Health Services telling me that they had been the subject of a data breach and my personal identifying information might have been lost, and I thought that's very odd. I don't use UCLA Health Services, so I don't know why they would send this to me. Um, and what they did with it, what, what happened, of course, was that my physician had sent lab, you know, um, lab work to be done. They sent it to UCLA, and UCLA had done it. And so, uh, unbeknownst to me, all my health data or some significant amount of my health data had been disclosed to UCLA Health Services, and they lost it. Oops. Um, and so it's like, huh, okay, it's like, you know, it's hard to keep control of these things. It's hard to manage them, um, given that we don't see the sort of corporate flows behind the scenes. And anyway, UCLA Health Services did the normal thing. You know, they gave me like a year's worth of free credit monitoring with Experian or whatever. <laughs> yeah, you know where this is going, right? Six months later, a letter from Experian. Oh, yes, we're very sorry. <laughs> We've lost your data too. Um, and so it's like, you know, here's the, uh, like, a company with which, or an institution with which I did not have a contracted relationship, and then given my data to another one, it's, it's just very difficult to like to. to, to, to and these things bizarrely only become visible when they lose the data. Um, so, so the notion of AI as a service, which we think, which which seems superficially appealing as a way to structure the kinds of investments in technology that we're currently making, and indeed the opportunities around advanced advanced AI technologies is premised also on this, um, this, this issue about trying to um, co-locate all, 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 all the data. Um, and that just implies to me at least a radically different kind of corporate relation at work. A similar kind of uh, thing applies to any of the accounts we see about AI and um, the other un inescapable term, the future of work. Inescapable to me in part because the National Science Foundation is a big program in this area and there are lots of people who are working in this area and, and you know, it, it often means gig economy kinds of things, it means platform economy kinds of things, it means um, sort of transformations of, of you know, our relationship to wage labor, the notion of the permanent job and the rest of it. Um, and AI plays a central role in that by postulating an alternative relationship between people and machines, people and technology, and therefore people and people. Um, but if we think about, think in terms of the, the locality and the localisms here, if we think in terms of the ways in which things need to be collocated in order to be correlated, um, then, then again, the future of work suggests, like, and the kinds of um, analyses, data analyses we need to be able to do here involve also that kind of large scale corporate consolidation in order to be, in order to be effective. There are lots of 
interesting um, ideas about how we might resolve this problem through the use of what I'm calling here like federated platforms. So for instance, any of you who've uh, signed on for something like you know Diaspora, which is one of the alternative Facebook alternatives that came out in the face of, I can't remember which ridiculous Facebook outrage it was because there's so many ridiculous Facebook What day is it? Tuesday? There must be another one. Um, it's like, but, but in the face of one or more of these, uh, you know, people started exploring the opportunity to have a social network that operated like Facebook but without having all the data in one place. Instead, there would be multiple different servers, each of which had their own private data. Or in the most extreme version of the federated one, we all just have our own private data. And corporate entities or others, institutional entities, need to come and ask us specifically um, for bits of data, which we can then sort of evaluate on a case-by-case -case basis and provide to them or, or not. But I think you can see where I'm going with this. It's like... That's fine as long as you are prepared not to be able to do any of the things that are actually the technological opportunities that we typically associate with those, with those services. If we like those technological opportunities, they actually cannot be federated. They depend upon, um, upon, cor uh, upon, upon locality and upon um, co-location. And so we need to be able to sort of think, um, federation here gets proposed in terms of um, institutional separation, but I think we also need to, be, need to think about federation in terms of its spatialities, the distribution of, um, of where data lives, where AI happens and where processing happens, or the temporalities by the same measure, which is maybe it's just going to take a lot longer to recognize that that's your cat. Again. Not for you to recognize that as your cat, but computers to recognize that as your cat. And then the last one I put on here, which is super important, of course, and the weightiest one, it's, on, it's not on here last, not because it's the least important, but because it's the most <coughs> challenging, um, are, are the climate impacts of the kinds of uh, processing on the scale on which AI depends. Some of you may have seen a report from, came out from UMass last year, I think, um, suggesting that um, building a single AI model that is training up one of those neural networks um, uses as much carbon as five cars over their lifetimes. Um, it, using that model doesn't, but building the model in the first instance is a computationally enormously expensive kind of, kind of thing. It is not as though capital hasn't encountered all sorts of um, situations where it depends upon um, right, ruinous resource impacts, but our normal solution for that has been to outsource things move them or to offshore them, to move them to places um, that we care about less. Uh, it's not clear to me that that works in this particular kind of case. One of the interesting things about the kinds of federation that I've been talking about is that these are not, or the kinds of um, consolidation and, and co-location of data that we've been talking about, is these are not things that involve um, uh, shipping stuff overseas. In fact, it is, this, this is all happening in San Francisco and Seattle and New York and Los Angeles. Um, in, uh, in, in large data centers. And so we're actually bringing this stuff home for ourselves. Um, and so recognizing that computation, you know, that, 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 that AI and deep learning has a spatial dimension due to the problem, the need for, the need for locality and co-location, and that it also has these climate impacts, and that they're the same, that is, we're having the climate impacts in the same place where we're doing the data co-location, I think might change, our, um, change some of the logic for how it is we want to think about what it is we're, uh, we're going to do with that stuff. Or again, the questions of feasibility. What do we think is reasonable? What do we think is doable? What do we think is a worthwhile trade-off? So, I'm just going to wind up here. Um, my interest for some time has been not so much, or maybe I should say not just, not just what AI does, which we spend a lot of time talking about, um, at least in the front page of the New York Times, uh, but where it does it, um, where AI happens. It's useful, I think, important to think about that with respect to the, you know, the, I was about to say, okay, Google, but then I wondered how many phones were something going to go beep, or hey Siri, <laughs> which this produces similar kinds of problems. Uh, my wife used to work for a radio show, and they would get in so much trouble anytime anybody said, like, hey, Alexa. Um, so, uh, so 
It's important. <laughs> Why was I going there? Oh yes. Um, uh, you know, part of that is like, where is the AI happening? Is the AI, how much of the AI is happening in my phone, and how much of the AI is happening um, in other kinds of places? And do I even know what's being what's what's going back and forth? But here I've sort of got this different kind of um, uh, take upon the where by sort of thinking about the sort of inherent geographical centrality and um, and consolidation uh, at work there. These are what I sometimes think about as like the twin problems of the cloud, right? The term the cloud. First, well, actually, this is kind of silly, but like, first, the, you know, that it seems to suggest things are immaterial, although clouds are very material. Um, but there's a sort of sense of the, of the, 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 the dissolution of things. Um, but also that, that the cloud is all in places, and there are very specific kinds of places. It's useful to reread the cloud as being a play for consolidation, right? As, be, as saying, there are seven data centers now that you're going to upload your data to, right? You know, if you're going to, if we're using the Amazon's cloud or Google's cloud, those are very specific kinds of places where that data, get, where the, that data gets, gets stored. It seems like a diffusion, but in fact, it's exactly the opposite. So I'm trying to do this stuff, and again, this is, as I said, super early, in order to sort of like rematerialize AI, to think about AI through the lens of digital materialities in the way in which I sort of tried to outline them to you earlier, and in a way that makes the material constraints upon what we call AI visible, particularly in the ways in which what we call AI is then articulated with particular kinds of corporate forms. Um, business opportunities and ways that we have of relating to, um, to capital and economies. And that's all I have, except that I also have time for questions, and hopefully you do too. Thank you. As long as we can all stand the warmth of the room. Yeah. Which, <laughs> I don't know how long that might be. Thank you so much. Oh yeah, I'll take my own question. Sorry, yes, sorry, I was going to. I should, I should say. Sorry, I had my head that earlier. I was going to ask. Uh, really interesting talk. I was going to ask if this is a, a matter of the present moment, and fast forward X number of years, everything that you're talking about becomes obsolete. Uh, that's a that's an interesting question. Um, these things, things are obviously moving targets. What I want to suggest is locality always beats non-locality, right, every time. And so, so what happens when computers get faster and those and networks get faster and those problems go away is that still, it's, you're, you can still do new things and better things by having them co-located. And so our expectations and demands of the, of the capacities of the technology continue to rise. Um, <laughs> although we could also argue that the history of AI has been like bringing AI to solve smaller and smaller and smaller or less relevant problems, such as cat identification. Um, I don't know why I'm throwing cats uh, um, so, so, so maybe that's a moving target too. But no, I think I think the um, the nature of the beast is simply that um, that locality always wins, and so um, so the, the targets will shift, and the kinds of things that are impossible to do without without radical data collocation just now will become possible in a more federated model. But the um, but there's but there will be different kinds of trade offs. Oh, and I should say too, I was going to mention this but didn't. Um, um, there's, 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 you know, there's active bodies of, uh, of research that begin to um, give us an idea about what a more federated uh, way of doing these things might be. So, like differential privacy is essentially focused on exactly that. How is it? How is it that we can set limits upon the um, the ways in which we have to share data in order, but still produce collective effects. But then it's all again about trade-offs. It's all about like you know, what what are you prepared to give up in order to be able to achieve that level of privacy? Yes. You mentioned um, like the materializing 
Um, well, I think, it, I think it goes to the structure of data centers and data farms for a start. It goes to, and it goes to how we start to think about those as being linked together or made, uh, uh, made effective in different kinds of ways. So for instance, one of the things we learned from Edward Snowden back, um, back all that time ago was that the way in which they were getting access to Google's data was when Google was backing things up from one data center to another. So it wasn't like they had like broken into Google servers, but Google needed to like shift data between centers, um, which has caused Google, I suspect, to change how they do that. Um, but I think um, the, the, the sort of architecture of data centers and those kinds of um, uh, things, so thinking not so much just about the geographical distribution, but even about the local spatialities, I think really sort of matter there. So that's, that, that, that's where I see that stuff. There you go. Hi. Hi. Um, I want to think a little bit about the relationship you're painting between materiality, feasibility, and the economic logics um, that are in your telling produced by the materialities of some of these systems. Or co-produced by. Or co-produced by, yeah. sure. Um, and you did a great job. I, I really appreciated how you painted feasibility as being relational or relative to what your goals are, right? And it seems like a part of feasibility, at least when it comes to what companies are doing with data, is what is permissible to do mm -hmm. or isn't objected to yet. Um, and I'm wondering if like, changing priorities of people who interact with companies about things like privacy or what, it, what we will permit to be done with our data might change some of the um, degrees of freedom they have to do things with our data that might then affect their economic logic. So if something like privacy becomes more important and we have something like federated learning or differential privacy, yep. does that then, how does, how does that fit in? That we can only hold, right? Sure. Uh, um, I became fascinated. Put this in a paper somewhere. I have more. Um, so I became fascinated a couple of years ago by this story that I had repeatedly read in the um, sort of trade press, which was that Apple was going to fail at AI because the best AI people wouldn't work for Apple because Apple's internal requirements about access to data were too strict. I don't know whether that's true. I don't really care whether it's true. It doesn't matter terribly, terribly much. What, me, what I'm interested in is the sort of conditions of possibility of that story, right? What it says about machine learning researchers, not, not, not much of which is good, um, um, but what it says also about like, the, 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 the landscape of, sort of, 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 of pressures there and how it sort of paints exactly the kind of trade-off that you were talking about as sort of bizarrely alien. Um, it would be nice to imagine that a, reg a different kind of regulative regime would change the dynamics and the of, of, of feasibility, right? That something would no longer be feasible if I was legally liable in a new set of, in a new set of ways. Um, that would be great. Um, I, what I want to do, is, which is not necessarily sort of like dissonant with that, is I want to sort of reincorporate that notion of feasibility into our expectations of what technology can do for us, as well as what tech firms can do for us. But, you know, what we want from, um, from these technologies, and therefore what we demand, and what we're prepared to put up with. Um, um, and I, and I, that's, that's the part that worries me more, which is that there's a sort of breathless anticipation of the opportunities that AI can offer. And this is partly, again, I did not go down the path of what AI is, because that's sort of part of the problem with the breathless opportunity, uh, like breathless enthusiasm. Um, and, and it's sort of like trying to understand for ourselves as consumers of these things and as users of these things what the trade-offs might be is actually part of this. I'm sorry, I'm not going to decide to record one, and then I'll come up with it. I'm wondering, I'm wondering how you might think about um, a term like friction. If you're, if you're, if you're talking about rematerializing, it seems like very quickly, as, as you just said, this comes up against different regulatory machines and or regimes rather. And like the argument you made about Apple, like relegating itself to being a, a deep learning backwater, which I've also heard apply to the EU, was that the GDPR mm -hmm. essentially, insofar it denies, as it denies the kind of inertia of deep learning, is relegating itself to be like a pawn between Beijing and uh, Silicon Valley. So maybe yeah. I'll just ask the annoying 
very broad question of like, does federated learning matter in Beijing? And like, these laws that you're talking about, is, is it, how, how, how does, how would you reconceptualize, uh, the, how would you rematerialize AI in Beijing versus Silicon Valley? That's a great question, which I'm going to be entirely puns on, because I have no <laughs> idea. Given that I've been thinking about this stuff for all of a week. Um, I mean, I think what I... <laughs> so I'm, I'm even going to try, because nothing I'm going to say is going to, is going to do adequacy to, uh, um, uh, to the question. I mean, I think the fact that these are global phenomena certainly matters. And the fact of the... I mean, I certainly want to try to undermine the inevitability argument, um, which I think is partly also about reconfiguring our expectations for what for, for, for what these things are. The interesting thing in the, in the in the China case, of course, is like you know, the primary user, the primary consumer, is the state, <laughs> um, and so it's a you know it's a, the, the 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 opportunity for for consumer intervention or 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 radically different sort. Um, but I really don't know. I, 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 it's not something I thought about enough to, um, to be able to answer that question. I think um, putting things into the context, uh, uh, sort of a geopolitical context, is really important. And, and recognizing the ways in which different kinds of technologies can be um, weaponized, um, for me specifically weaponized within within a sort of logic of like you know if, you know we, we don't do it those guys do or like you know kind of kind of thing yeah. is um is 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 yeah deeply fraught and horrid and yes but important I don't I don't know what to do. I mean I guess my, my question is like could you imagine the arguments that you've been making being used by someone at Google to say look you know Beijing is oh, is abiding for by sure. this frictionless paradigm. <coughs> So we have to as well. Right. And I, no, absolutely. And I think, again, it's why to put this into conversation with, uh, you know, if one talks about frictionless as well as friction, then one is automatically, like, you know, thinking about the economic arguments in the variety of other places where frictionless innovation, frictionless trade, and the rest of it are, 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 are formulated. Um, and it is that kind, of, that, that kind of argument. So, yeah, I can absolutely see that. Um, and the question again then is, what are the resources that might become available to us for placing limits or bounds, or even just making visible some of the things that are, that are going on there? I think a lot of this, in the, as, a, as a sort of first level of intervention, is to try to make some of these things visible to mm -hmm. us, so that um, so we're at least in, in a, able to have a decent conversation about it. Thank you. Peter. Yeah. Um, great talk. Thanks. Um, so maybe because you started with B and C and C. Plus that got me thinking about pointers and this idea of locality and memory as a physical address. But sort of the power of C++ is that you can pass addresses as numbers and so you're actually kind of moving away from the physicality of the adjacency of two memory <coughs> registers because you can drop to any kind of memory register within the active memory. And then thinking, so is locality in a physical sense the word that you want, in a material sense the word that you really want is this adjacency is this might be a more demographic concept. And then thinking about the data clouds and clusters, is it that these data sets have been integrated into the same database in a way that we can you know, connect certain types of data? Um, or, because if they're just sitting on the same physical hard drive, that doesn't um, In terms of this sort of C, C++ thing, I mean, one of the things that yeah, so we use, we use I, th I still think locality is a better term than adjacency because it's not simply about sweeping through memory. It's also about sort of um, uh, you know, things that are sort of temporarily bounded. And even in the most ridiculous case of jumping back and forth between different kinds of things in C++, if you're running on a system with virtual memory, we've relocalized things, right? That's how, that's how virtual memory works. Um, so, uh, so, so, so there's, I, I still think it's a useful term. I think also it's a useful term because it's a point of entree into a conversation with a bunch of technologists for whom that's a very familiar, that's a familiar territory. And, and, and I think it's useful to hold on to the, the familiarity of those phrases in order to be able to sort of enter into those, enter into those conversations. Um, uh, and I've forgotten the second part of your question, which is really embarrassing. Locality in the cloud. Right, right. Um, 
I mean, it, this is clearly locality in a different, in a different, very different kind of kind of form. But I think what I want to try to retain is this idea of the dependability of access and reach. That is, that you know, something is going to be there for me when I come and look for it, um, and that I can depend upon the availability. Of, you know, that is that the. Um, the availability of data is not a constraint upon the functioning of the algorithm. Right? I mean, the odd thing is that your know, complexity theory will tell us all sorts of um, constraints upon what your algorithm can do on the basis of what of, of where data is, but very little, or, or what data you have, but very little it can say about what uh, about where the data is. To be able to sort of like theoretically, and I mean that in the sort of computational mathematical sense, right? To be able to reincorporate the material shape of, or topology of the, um, of, the, of, the, um, of the data network into the ways in which we think about what it is that the algorithms can do and AI can do would I think be a useful starting point. You're, you're right that I'm sort of like, you know, shifting a little bit about what the locality is. But I actually, um, when, you, when I think about the ways in which, you know, distributed systems operate, the ways in which locality gets exploited in operating systems and page replacement algorithms, as well as in programming languages, there's already a great deal of slippage in there. When you talked about federated platforms, I was thinking about blockchain technology. Do you think there's a possibility of an AI technology that in which we, we don't work towards building a, a big, perfect model, but a bunch of deep learners which work with really many centralized distributions Um, I think it's almost definitely the case that it would not give better performance. <laughs> I think, uh, um, and I actually, it's, it's really interesting to try to think about blockchain through the lens of feasibility, because blockchain is this amazing, uh, what's, what's the phrase I want to use? Feasibility just doesn't really come up very much for a lot of blockchain, which, which you know, don't store massive, data, massive degree, amount, amount, amounts of data in that way, and depend upon things being replicated in ways that uses space on all our hard drives. So I think that's the goal. I think many people have, see, see that as an opportunity. I think perhaps being able to better articulate what we would be giving up in order to achieve the benefits that we would get with that is a useful, is a useful thing. A useful exercise. Um, I don't think that um, the the technological characteristics are any better. In fact, I think they're by and large what works. I think the social characteristics may be a lot better. But then the question is again one of um, being uh, better understanding ourselves, what the landscape of trade offs and, and, and opportunities might be. Well, actually, that was going to be uh, my question because my question was what is the blockchain? more transactions moving onto blockchain space, what does that do to the materiality in the sense that could you could you have a blockchain-based AI that would draw the data from the blockchain, but then the data is potentially sitting on a massive <coughs> number of computers? I don't think that helps terribly much. I mean, one, th it's gonna be one of these things like, Mickey Mouse walking off the cliff, right? The question is, how far can I walk without looking down and realizing and, and, and revealing just how little I understand about blockchain technology? But um, my understanding of most blockchains, I mean, blockchain depends on massive replication. Blockchain depends on the idea that we all have access to all of the data, at least in an encrypted and hashed form. Um, and, and as such, um, it, it essentially limits our capacities to work with data to the limits of the data capacities of each of the places where that stuff is replicated. Um, I can't put Google's data center onto the SSD in my laptop. Um, I, and th that's the point. Um, and, uh, and indeed, with the sort of kind of consolidations we've seen, it becomes harder and harder to recapture um, that stuff within a frame of uh, like, like blockchain. There was an article I read a couple of years, no, maybe less than that, six months ago, um, and I need to go and track it down. It was basically making the suggestion that it's already too late that for anybody other than Google, Facebook, Apple, Microsoft, and 
the other one. It's like the Seven Dwarfs is always one, right? Um, uh, to, to do cutting edge AI research anymore, not just because they have access to the data that you need in order to be able to do it, but in fact, they're the only people who can mass computational resources on the scale, at the scale at which you want to do it. Um, and, and scales play an important role in here. Um, I think the, dat the, the, the data platforms have already exceeded, or the data needs have already exceeded the kinds of things the blockchain technologies as we know them so far have been able to offer to us. And so it may already be too late for that to do, to do these kinds so of things. So there's a monopoly issue. There, uh, but, yeah. Not just with who owns the data, but also who owns the, the computational capability Yes, 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 that was, yeah, it's like I didn't, I, there was a point where that was going to go into these slides and I forgot, but yeah, it's another thing. So I just had a really quick comment, which is I once took a course on Coursera to try to understand, you know, what all of this was about, and when you go through the neural networks, it's extremely mysterious, because they give you, here's a formula, here's a statistical formula, a sinoid function, and this is what you're using to connect this neural, this node to the sinoid. Why? And no one can explain. So, so no one can explain to you why do you use this function. It works is the answer. But so we don't really understand this form of intelligence, and I guess we don't understand our brains either. But there's something very disconcerting, at least for me, that we don't understand why the neurons are yep. mapped yep. the way yep. they are. Yep. You know. Well, I think the question of whether whether understanding anything about how the neural networks work is telling us anything about our brains is, is, a, is a, an open question. And there's lots of people, while many people, you know, of the, you know, Terry Solansky type, like, came into this stuff in order to try to model brains, lots of people could care less about brains. They just care about the fact that they can tell the difference between dogs and cats. There we are again. There's a great paper, Maggie, I have forgotten the name of the student, like, by, with Steve Jackson and one of his students on the visualization class that they studied, data science class. Uh, with uh, Samir Passi. Samir, that's right. So this is a lovely paper by um, Samir Passi and um, Steve Jackson at, uh, at Cornell. And what they did was they, they, they did an ethnography inside a class where people were sort of learning both about data visualization to an extent, but also about sort of data science. Um, and they made this observation that, or they showed that what's happening is like, you know, people in class play with small data sets, and the interesting thing with those small data sets is that they're actually understandable. I put it into the vision, I, I, I process it, and it says, oh, there's two clusters in here, there's things that are more like this and things that are more like that. But you can actually look at the entire data set and say, oh yeah, there are two clusters. I can see them. When I just look at the raw data, I can see that there's two kinds of things here. So that's great. These algorithms work. It has correctly told me there's two, there's two clusters in here. Now I'm going to apply that algorithm to 25 bazillion records over here where nobody can possibly look. And I know that what comes out must be correct because I've seen it half operate in this sort of like a toy, toy name. It's actually very reminiscent of the sort of the closed world, blocks world kind of like analogies of, um, of, of, of early AI. Um, and so that, the, the interesting thing is how that mystery that you talk about is um, dissolved and then turns into confidence about the effectiveness of techniques that are um, beyond our ability to, ass to assess. I said to somebody once that the AI really excels at questions that don't really have an answer. Um, you know, are it, I do a search on the on um, on a search engine. There is no way for me to assess whether that is actually the most relevant result. I don't have a basis of assessing that. Um, it's it's plausible. It's like AI is the technology of truthiness, right? It's, pl it's sort of a plausible <laughs> answer, but I can't say yes, that's it. And I'm fascinated in the process by which confidence is developed in. Um, in, the, in the essentially unknowable of um, the application of these algorithms to data sets that are either too massive for anybody to be able to assess or are changing too quickly for anybody to assess or are too real time for anybody to assess. It's a, that's a, that, you, you, you're, you're, the mystery that you were experiencing is fascinating. The question of how it dissipates is equally fascinating, I think. Do we still have time? I'm just going to keep on taking questions as long as we have time. Okay, great. I just want to give you the opportunity, and this is a little unfair because we had a lunchtime conversation that's a little unfair to the room, but to link that comment about this confidence with the confidence that we also have of like we can get the ethics right. <laughs> but like there's this thing happening here, we're gonna intervene now, 
outside with some ethical propositions that are going to make it less biased or come out with more correct versions of whatever, right? So well, and especially actually the fact that in, in many circles then that turns into a statistical property in itself, right? That is, that there, there, there's an analysis that will tell me how biased my data is, and then I need to optimize for that, right? I need to optimize for its reduction, presumably, um, hopefully. Uh, um, and uh, Stuart Russell has this whole thing on what he calls like, you know, provably human compatible AI. Uh, uh, like that we will be able to mathematically determine that it's acting in our best interests, wow. um, which it's great. <laughs> yeah, so, so, so it's all done and we can go home. Um, I keep forgetting this is being recorded. Uh, so, <laughs> um, but it does, I mean, yeah, I think that, that, that question of how, yes, yeah, so the ethics is absolutely a part of the, um, or the, or the, I wouldn't even say the ethics because for reasons. But, uh, but yeah, those questions of sort of bias or appropriateness are, are, are equally problematic. And then the transformation of that, right, over time. How is it that something which might well be a, an effective strategy right now doesn't track with, um, with the change of experience and data? And that, again, goes to the sort of ethics thing as, as frequently being closed off, as being sort of hermetically sealed and just sort of like, oh, that is ethical. That's not. We're done. Right. Can I ask a weird question on the tail end of that? No, sorry, I'm here, but um, is the, I find really interesting in what you presented that locality is both a desire and a constraint. Mm -hmm. So it's like this really interesting epistemological foundation that I can't say much about because I don't know anything about this, but, but and that's, that ambiguity is really, really, probably really important. But does that, in your critique of typical ways that ethics are being spoken about, ethics in relation to AI, is being spoken about, would that term somehow come, like in your elaboration of what's wrong with the way we're thinking about how ethics needs to be elaborated, like would that term somehow come into play? This is so uh, I, I mean, certainly that, certainly that duality, I don't think the locality in any way, but the duality of sort of like opportunity and constraint uh, um, is, or observable property and constraint is certainly is certainly there. Again, in this sort of desire through the this sort of question of confidence for the ethical problem to just dissolve itself and and, and disappear so that we can all get on with business, um, <laughs> literally. Yeah. Uh, um, and so uh, so 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 it it's you know, and this is why we were talking this, this morning. It's like you know that many of my encounters with, with computer science and AI people, right, some of these questions is now are very prickly because they're now trying to get used to the fact that they're the villains in any movie or television show or book, um, whereas for the last you know, several years they've been celebrated and for the years before that they were ignored. And I think it's like, I think again, it's like this notion that, that it's a constraint, it's an obstacle, it's something that's preventing me, goes to this Apple story, um, that, that, that the relationship of, of, say in that case, privacy to, to AI is always one of obstacle and constraint, but I think that's sort of mm -hmm. a, a, an interesting part of it. If I ask you to say a bit more about locality and the C++, mm -hmm. and that if I wanted a more wacky search, so when I think about my own research in libraries, that many scholars will talk about the serendipity of finding mm -hmm. things on mm -hmm. the shelf behind, or actually not in the sequential three-decimal right. system. So if I said, okay, I really want to relax the constraints of the C++, um, given the increase in computational capacity, I understood that the way you were talking about it partly was that it was a trade-off between time and linearity <coughs> in a fashion. Is that I, I mean, well, it's like, I, I, I mean, I, 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 more inventive search. I, I, I was being, Skimmed over, skimmed over a lot. Here's all I'll say. I mean, it's like um, more inventive search is always, always available. Randomness, serendipity, all these things are easy to introduce in modern computational systems. Yeah, that's fine. What is interesting, perhaps, about say something like C++ is this notion of sort of um, of iteration with the locale, with locality, is directly built into the core of the language. 
randomness is part of the standard library that you can choose to use if you want to or not, but it's not a core linguistic feature. It's not something that we expect to see mapped onto the um, instruction set of the processor um, that is that's, that, that, that's executing, executing the code. So it occupies a place of centrality and significance within the sort of like that the, the landscape that the programming language offers um, in a different kind of in a different way than um, those other things that we would depend on in order to try to sort of like think in a, in a more serendipitous way. Now, obviously, I could also encode like different kinds of uh, uh, you know classification systems that were based on different kinds of properties into the into the computational. Uh, right? It's not that like, it doesn't it doesn't lead me directly and inexorably towards uh, towards a, a linearity mm -hmm. or other kinds of other kinds of things that can be that can be done. Um, but in terms of how it is that people are trained to think about what programs can do and what programs can easily do and what programs ought to do. Um, certain, the features that are part of the core language, I think, um, have a different kind of uh, um, significance. <coughs> um, I'm still trying to wrap my head around your idea of locality, but let me uh, just ask a question about that. Um, is it the same as or analogous to um, centralization? And to what extent then, I mean, because then you, part of the argument you could, or, or to, to an outsider, part of what one could see in your argument is the drift from kind of the early promise of the internet as this kind of distributed network of possibilities um, to what was the kind of first generation of centralization around kind of the AOLs and the, you know, the Microsofts and whatever that were sort of centralizing corporate power and portals and such like, so that the internet became no longer quite so distributed. Um, to now, we're at this point where what you're talking about in terms of AI is actually the physical co-location of the databases. There's even a like, more material, more a greater intensification of centralization. And I'm just curious about how one then thinks about the fragility of centralized systems in contrast to the kind of uh, resilience of more distributed systems. Are these corporations that are building these increasingly co-located and centralized kinds of data uh, storage systems, et cetera, are they putting themselves at risk um, right. because they're giving up a lot of the affordances of a more distributed model? Uh, the, 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 the techniques by which it has come, come to be With respect to distributed <laughs> systems, risk and fragility, um, well, risk is always relative, right? What's the what's the risk that's being argued? I mean, it's like we, you know, there are any number of arguments from the you know early network days about the inherent resilience of um, of distributed networks. By and large, in practice, the efforts towards centralization have been in support of resilience, but different kinds of resilience. Um, um, you know, so. Internet routing protocols gradually reproduced a new sort of much more centralized internet, the contemporary internet, much more centralized than the original internet was conceived to be. Not in terms of like corporate um, presences or firewalls such as, you know, or wall gardens such as like Apple's or AOL's. Yeah, those were the days. Um, um, but even just in terms of like how packet flows and how, how the packets flow around and where, where, how the order gateway protocol, exterior gateway protocol, things about it. So, but that's been in service of a resilience against other kinds of risks that aren't necessarily the risks that you or I might imagine. So for instance, the border gateway protocol really locks down how it is that data can flow because the idea that, that, that you know that was fundamental to Paul Barron's work that you know data would find another way to flow in or out is actually regarded as a major problem by businesses who want to be sure that data flows in or out of their organization through just one place that can be monitored, managed, controlled, and, um, and, and regulated, and if necessary, shut off. Um, and so the risks that are being you know, guarded against, you're absolutely right about sort of fragility and risk, but, um, the, but there's, a, there's radically different kinds of landscapes of risk depending on where you're standing. All right, I'll ask.
ask one question. Uh, just one. Just one? Really? Just that seems <laughs> so unlikely. Yeah, it's, it's going to be like... It's one, one question, but uh, yeah, okay, one of those. Uh, let's think about what's going on right now from the confines of classical political economy. Um, the means of production, right? There's the factory, and the bourgeoisie owns the factory, and the workers work for it. And then, if you're coming from a Marxist point of view, the labor power, who is from the body of the laborer, right, is what creates the value in that thing, right? And then, if, if you come from Bantam and whatever, it's the um, utility that users see in that thing that is produced. It's detached from the condition of production and dragged to relationship of exchange. Right? This is the major two major theories of value. How do you think about value and valuation in this new materialities of the digital world that are distributed in locality, in time, in space, and also hardcore things that are in rural New Jersey. I don't think you should have an answer. But when you think by yourself, like, what is going on in this world, does it require us to rethink theories of value all the time from the beginning of mo modern politics and industrialization? Or uh, would, you, would it ask us to rethink value since the emergence of the digital? I'm glad you don't think I should have an answer to this question. <laughs> um, I, it's, it's not clear to me how deeply we need to reconsider theories of value and valuation in general. We may want to think differently about how it is that data comes to have value. Um, and we may want to think about um, you know, data relationally such that the value, um, value accumulates not in the data in itself, but in, again, the massification of that or it's the, 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 the bringing of it into alignment with or into proximity with other things. Um, if, the, if the value of the data, and particularly, I mean, that is the, 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 the lesson of the AI stuff and the statistical stuff in general, right? that value lies within the correlations that can be made from one data set to another, from one data item to another, or how it is that one data item can then be um, sort of amplified and said to speak to others because we understand it in, in, terms, of, in terms of a model. Um, so it then becomes not the data in itself um, or in themselves uh, that, that, that hold value, but in the, but in the, the, the collections of those. And so it, I don't think that then is a reconfiguration of our notions of value, but I think it may be a change in how we think about data coming to have value for particular people at particular times. But so much social science talks about data as like a new commodity. I know. And what you just said. I know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. No, it's like um, the, the, the data is the new oil is, um, is, a, is a phrase you can't help but trip but The data for, in but itself is not valuable. It's like a truck. I could like four. Great. Give me a chip. <laughs> there was one empirical set from a historian actually, in historian of colonization. Um, Tim Mitchell, for instance, looked at how orders in colonizing Egypt created frameworks, very much like we're talking mm -hmm. about right now. They changed the way subjects relate to those frameworks with framing them in a sense that when you internalize the power relationships, things begin to appear to you as external. Right. This was very important, and he called it metaphysics of modernity. And we thinking of that the economy external to us is, as if it has a material uh, reality, is actually a discursive effect, which draws on materialities, very much like what you're talking about, data is a representation. And because of this representational value, it is materially uh, uh, observable. And, that's, and, and that you can also uh, intervene in it. So, right. which is, I'm trying to mm -hmm. relate yep, this yep, yep, to yep. your work of about mm -hmm. ethics and um, about AI. And maybe 
those colonial studies that looked at modern orders, right. in a yeah, Foucauldian, yeah. Uh, classical Foucauldian way, may be of help to us. Oh yeah, think absolutely. About data is representation instead of data is oil or data as if it has near ontology. It doesn't. Well, plus I think many of the properties of categorization and classification and abstraction and you know um, that, that that are you know deeply familiar to the practice of, of, of computation are are you know were developed or honed to their to their their the sharpest points during yeah. the colonial periods exactly. and for colonial enter, colonial enterprises. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think it's all, but also if we take this notion that. Um, that, that, that the data acquires value in its relationships to other data, and you also realize the other data is already there, right? Yeah. It's like, you know, so it's, it's with respect to yeah. that, the new pieces yeah. of data, like, you know, I understand that there are already data sets that I have, you know, that allows me to ascribe value to, to, to new data, even though what I'm actually ascribing value to is the relationship between that other data and what data I know I'm, I already own or already have access to or, um, or you know, expect to be able to capture. That's why I think for during part here, because I think your perspective opens up a new forms of collaboration, say, from designers who are now realizing that their strategic design considerations about organizations have been used by sneaky social scientists like economists who use design interventions such as supply and demand graph to show the undesigned nature of our economies. That it's natural, it comes from our human nature. It's like Adam Smith, your guy from Kirtan. <laughs> <laughs> I know where he's buried, but it's like that's not the same yeah. thing. So <laughs> So the, then the next step is going to be, uh, if not democratizing, but opening up this area of thinking to designers, social scientists. And a lot of social scientists think that they can only study the consequences of data systems or platforms or computers. And many designers think that you really need to study computer science to think about those representational systems. But this is not necessarily the case. This is what you actually show me. Yes. I agree. You were not listening. <laughs> <laughs> I saw that. No, no, no. Uh, please join me. Uh, welcome. Thank you all.